Hello, this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is a build guide for the Montec King 95. In this video, I'm going to show you how to transform this case into this final view with a 360 millimeter radiator and a setup which includes multiple fans, Montec fans, and NZXT fans, as you'll see. Now, obviously, a build guide can't encompass every possibility because you might want to do something different, like here, for example, with a 280 mil radiator on the side instead. 140 mil fans at the bottom but i am going to talk about some of the highlights of the case and show you what's possible for example you can choose between that glass front panel or the mesh airflow one so there are a lot of things to talk about i'm going to leave timestamps down below so that you can leap to specific points in the video nice and easily but quickly before we get started i want to show you a few important things to be aware of if you're building in this case and you're planning your PC build with it, because there are a lot of different options here available. You'll see that the side panel here, for example, can be adjusted so that you can remove the thumb screws and then just move it out and push it towards the front. And that's how you get those two fans on the front instead, if you want to do that. So here you've got two 140 millimeter fans front mounted in that tray, which then allows you to use the airflow panel for better airflow through the case. This tray is multi-purpose because you can use it in this way and change the aesthetic completely. Or alternatively, you can keep it in place and mount a radiator to it or fans to the side panel instead where that would normally go. Another thing is that the specs of the case say that you can put a 280 mil radiator here, but actually I found you can't. So it's too wide to fit into that tray. So it's just not possible to do. Instead, you need to move the tray out of the way by either adjusting it towards the front or getting rid of it entirely. However, you can put a 240 millimeter radiator there as an alternative. So if you want to side mount an all-in-one cooler, you can do that. Or alternatively, you can just move this tray either out towards the front or you can completely unscrew it and remove it out of the case entirely if you're not planning on using it. So if you want to keep that glass front panel, for example. So it's important to bear these sorts of things in mind. This is a interesting setup that gives you a few different options in how you mount things and where you install them. Now I have in the review of this case talked about installing a radiator on the side here, for example. So this is the 280 millimeter radiator. You still can install it there. Once you take that tray out, you can mount it to the back. But the downsides of this is, as you can see, the cables are a lot more visible. So that's something to keep in mind there. It does mount quite easily to the back, but then that also makes the build process a little bit more fiddly because you have to deal with moving this around and things as well during the build. So a little bit tricky. There are a number of highlights to the King 95 that include this tray as well. Now, this is an SSD and hard disk drive mounting tray, which you can attach to the bottom of the case you can put up to three ssds or three hard disk drives or a mix of those onto the tray and screw them in you have screws included in the little accessories box that allow you to easily do this and the instructions tell you which ones are which there's also anti-vibration washers for your hard disk drives so that you can mount those now this won't be for everybody because it replaces the fans that would go on the bottom of the case that would blow onto your graphics card so you can install these like this if you want loads of storage and then put it there, plug in all the cables, and then you've got extra drive storage because there are also places at the back of the case. I'm not going to show the full setup for this because I wouldn't personally do this in my build because I think having airflow blowing onto your graphics card is more important. But if storage is the key thing for you, then this is one of the options I thought is worth showing before I show the build that I carried out. The other thing is you have multiple mounting points for SSDs and hard disk drives in other places too. So you can mount one on the hard disk drive cage at the side here. You can also mount a couple on this side plate as well. So you can install them that way quite easily. You basically just screw in through there and then you can connect them up at the back there. And then you just need to work out how you're gonna run the cables to that, which I will show later on. Alternatively, you can use these black screws that are included in the little box, put them into the SSDs, and then just push that into the hard disk drive tray. The hard disk drive cage also has two slots in it, which you can use for SSDs and hard disk drives. So there's potential for loads of different storage options, depending on whether you're going to be using SSDs 
and hard disk drives in your build. I'm going to talk a bit more about this, how to connect these up and how to wire them later on and where to put them because as I said, I wouldn't use that front tray and depending on where you mount them can cause some issues. But the hard disk drive cage makes for easy use because you can just slide these trays out, put your drive into that with relative ease, pop it back in and then plug the cables in once you get to that stage of the build. These cages are also nice because the plastic housing has some little clips in it which just slots into the sides of your hard disk drive and then you can screw it in as well to secure it further and then obviously they're hidden out of sight a bit more effectively with this cage than with anything else. So loads of different storage options available in this case which make it nice and I think it's worth pointing out the potential options for you before you go about building. The other important thing to talk about is obviously the fan setup as well. Now I've done a full wiring guide on Montex fans that I'll link to in the description with some other helpful links to other related videos but you can use a mix of 140mm and 120mm fans in this case and I'd highly recommend also checking out the links down below for the related wiring tool in the Thermalrite hub that I've used there. The thing of note is if you put 140mm fans on the bottom, you can only actually fit two down there. It looks like space for three, but you actually can't fit three in there because these screw directly into holes at the bottom, which is fairly unusual and a bit strange. So if you want to fill up the case and make it look nice, I'd recommend actually instead going for 120 millimeter. The thing that's interesting about this design is it uses long screws that are included in the accessories box. So watch out for that little plastic accessories box has all the screws in it. It's clearly labeled and in there you'll find some long screws and that's how you screw fans into the bottom of the case, which is fairly unusual because you usually screw them in from below with the included screws that come with the fans. These ones screw in from the top. The other thing of note I found here is if you screw these screws in too tight, it can actually cause a problem where there's a lot of noise coming from the fans. Now I'm using standard fans here face down into the case to pull air in from below. You could instead use reverse blade fans so you could see the top of the fans like the ones that are side mounted on the radiator. Those are still intake as well. But what I found is if you tighten these up too much, it actually results in a very loud noise as the blades touching the bottom of the case. So if you experience the same problem, that may well be it. I just found if I loosen the screws a little bit, that actually stopped that issue. So it wasn't much of a problem. But it doesn't seem to be Montec fans exclusively that caused this issue because I've also seen the same thing with a deep cool fan that I tested out there. But the other thing is that gap which isn't present with 120 millimeter fans. The fans screw directly into holes at the bottom of the case rather than sort of a long bracket. So you can't adjust the positioning of them. You just have to screw them in where they sit so you can see where the 120 mil fans go in here and how they secure. But that looks nicer in my mind because it fills up the bottom of the case more effectively. Now for this build, I'm using some fairly illogical specs. I've got a 4090 in here and an i3 processor. Don't copy that because you would get a bottleneck, but I wanted to demonstrate how much space the 4090 takes up in the case and just to show that you've got plenty of room for that. I'm also using a power supply unit which probably hasn't got enough power for the 4090 and the other things in here. Don't copy like for like and build the same thing. Some of it is for demo purposes, but I will leave the specs all down in the description below so you can find out more. And now we're going to rewind to the beginning when the case is empty and I'm going to tell you all the different things that you need to do in order to set it up in the same way I have, which is with a 360 millimeter radiator on the top, the airflow panel on the front, filling it up with fans to make it look as nice as possible and getting a similar style there. Now, this thing comes apart really easily. The top pulls off by just tugging at it. Bear that in mind when you've finished building it because you don't want that to accidentally drop the case because you're trying to pick it up by the lid. You'll also find on the top here, there's a built-in mesh panel for dust management. So keep that in mind. The side panel removes with a thumb screw, then you just need to pull it towards you and lift it up because it has some clips. You can do the same with the front glass panel and I'd recommend getting that out even if you're going to keep it in place because it will make life easier building. The same with the dust tray at the bottom which you can just pull from the rear and tug that out of the way too. The rear panel also has a thumb screw that holds it in place. Then again, just pull it towards you and then lift it up. You'll see some hooks on the bottom that hold it in there. And then there's also a dust panel on the rear of this as well, which isn't removable, but you will need to clean over time. 
At the rear here, you'll find there's a door, which is multi-purpose, because as I've shown you, you can mount the SSDs to it, radiator to it, and other things. It is secured with a couple of little tiny screws at the top and bottom, which you'll need to unscrew to remove. Now, I actually found this door to be a bit fiddly because when you've done that, obviously it's then moving around. And if you're turning the case around, flipping it over and doing other things, you might find that this door regularly just opens. So I actually ended up having to secure it and re-secure it a few times, undoing and redoing those screws, but they're very small, so make sure you don't lose those. Inside, you'll find the cables for the front panel connectors, HD audio, your power button, and other things, and I'll talk about those in a little while. And then we've got the case mostly stripped down into its bare state, which will make life easier during the build process. You can see there are a number of areas to run cables through quite nicely and to adjust things. Now in the accessories box, as I've shown already, there are a number of things, including the manual and the little tiny box, which contains all the screws. This is really nicely labeled, which will make your life easier because you'll easily be able to see which screws you need. Then you'll find that SSD tray, which I showed you earlier on, which we won't be using now but there are instructions on how to do it if you do want to use that and then the airflow panel which i am going to use merely because i wanted to show how to do it you don't have to naturally if you'd rather go for the glass panel then it will be fairly easy to skip a couple of steps in this build process in order to avoid that and i'll leave timestamps down below so you can easily jump to relevant points i'm going to start with ssd mounting just to show you the options which i covered briefly but now what you need to do is just think about where you're going to place it I found on the hard disk drive cage is the most logical because if you install one on the door as I am here with the four screws, what I found is it's a bit harder to plug in the power cables from your power supply unit. If you use the little black standoff screws instead and then secure it to the hard disk drive cage, it makes life a little easier in terms of connecting the cables and keeping things neat. This is also a really easy way to do it because you just use your thumbs to secure these screws and then just push into those rubber washers on the side of the tray. So this would be my recommendation. If you've only got one drive, this is the easiest way to install it from what I've seen. Alternatively, you've got the hard disk drive mounting cage as I showed earlier on, which is another option if you want to do that. But you can basically just pop that in, secure it, and then obviously you're running it so the front connectors go towards the left and then you can plug in your power and data cables and I'll show you where later on as well. Then I'm setting up the motherboard. Now this is an ASRock Live Mixer Z790. Again, the illogical specs that I talked about because I've got an i3 processor from Intel, the i3-13100, which doesn't make sense to combine with a 4090, but it is what I happen to have. You secure that by lifting the hatch up then gently lowering it down and then putting that back down and then securing that lever in place to keep it nice and tight in there. Just be careful that you don't bend any pins during that process. The RAM goes into slots A2 and B2, which is the second slot, and then the fourth slot along. You need to make sure you put those in the right place so that it will boot properly and that you'll get the right RAM speeds out of it. This is crucial DDR5 Pro RAM, which is actually very affordable and fast and stealthy. Then I'm using a T705 from Crucial, which is a Gen 5 NVMe SSD. Now you'll note on this board, it has a really chunky heatsink. So if you're using a standard NVMe SSD, you would use this heatsink to keep your drive cool. And there's a sticker under there, which you need to remove. So you've got the thermal coverage on that. It just slots into one of these slots at the top here. This drive, however, has its own heat shielding which means that you don't need to use that standard one. And the faster Gen 5 drives will require these heat shields because if they run too hot, they will thermally throttle and then they won't be as efficient and they won't run as fast as they should. So obviously you need to make sure you've got a good board for this. I've done a full guide on NVMe SSDs and everything you need to know that I'll link to in the description that might be useful if you're curious. But this secures down with an M2 screw into the slot on the side there, and these are the easiest options for storage, much easier than SSDs and hard disk drives because they just connect straight to the motherboard and there's no power cables needed. So this setup motherboard is now mostly ready. The other thing we're going to do though is secure the back plate for the AIO because I'm using an NZXT Kraken cooler in this build 
and I'll leave the specs again in the description so you can find out more. I've done a full wiring guide on this cooler in the past, which I'll link to, which will make life easier if you're not sure. But this one has a back plate which pushes through the four holes on the motherboard there, and then you need to secure the standoff screws on the other side to hold this in place. I find this easier to do before it's in the case because the hard disk drive cage is in the way otherwise, and also it's just a bit more fiddly doing it standing up, so you can lay it flat on a good surface and then just secure those standoffs into the four corners, making sure they're nice and tight. And that is then ready for the cooler a bit later on in the build. So the motherboard's now set up and ready to go. And then I'm going to use this outside of the case to demonstrate some wiring and where you connect cables. We're first going to start off with a power supply unit, which is an 850 watt modular power supply unit from Montec. And this is good enough in most instances. And I've done a guide separately on how to work out which power supply is right for you. But this has a number of connections on it that'll be perfectly fine for this build. The only thing is it probably doesn't have enough power for the 4090 when you combine it with all the other things but it will be good enough for this. And I'll show you the steps for your build to logically set it up. We'll start with the motherboard power connections, which is three cables, one large one, and then two marked CPU. So the large one is the 24 pin power cable, which connects the right hand side of the motherboard. This is important you need to make sure this is well secured and in both ends of the power supply and the motherboard to ensure that you're getting power through. Again, I'm showing you this outside the case so you can see it nice and clearly, but obviously you would actually install the power supply and everything else and then plug the cables in at nearer the end of the build. But I wanna show you how to do it now. So at the end, which is split into two parts, you plug that into the power supply unit. So the larger end goes into the one marked motherboard and then the other power cable goes below that. These need to be pushed all the way in. You'll notice there's a little clip on top of them push that all the way in, it will secure that cable into place and ensure that you're getting the power through because often if your PC is not booting or not turning on, it might be that these cables are loose at either end. The other end plugs in on the right hand side of the motherboard and slots into place. Again, there's a plastic clip which you can see on the outside of the connector and on the cable. So you need to make sure it's lined up that way. You can only plug it in one way. Then there are two CPU power cables which are marked CPU on one end. You plug the other end into the power supply unit and then you need to secure those to the top left of the motherboard. This is for additional power for the motherboard and I would recommend plugging them in if you have them. You may find your motherboard has different connectors. Sometimes there might be only one eight pin power cable at the top left here. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's one eight pin and one four pin. You need to split the cables in that case and run them together. Next is the SATA power connections. So this is for the SSDs and hard disk drives and other things as well. Fan controllers, for example, as I'll show you later. So you plug in the one end into the SATA port on the power supply unit. And then the other end has this flat L-shaped connector on it, which is daisy chain. So you notice there's multiple connectors on one cable and you plug your SSDs into it. So this is a crucial drive but you can see we're just gonna plug that power cable into the larger port on there. Notice it's got a little L-shaped bracket in it, so you can only plug it in one way. So if you find it won't go in, it's because you've got it the wrong way around. And that's how the power cable would connect. And then you need the data cable, which I'll show you in a second where that goes. But because this has multiple connections on it, you can plug in another drive into here with ease, and you can connect multiple drives that way into one cable so you don't have to have loads of cables and this is handy if you've got lots of storage that you want to connect up there. So this cable can be used for different things, hard disk drives, SSDs, fan controllers and other things as well. But you might need another cable so this one actually comes with two of these and then you've got four connectors here so we can plug in another drive with relative ease. You may find other power supply units have a lot more connections as well. But this is a fairly straightforward setup for the power. But then obviously you need a cable from your motherboard. Now this usually comes with the motherboard. You'll find this data cable included with your motherboard. It connects at one end to the drive and then the other end to the motherboard. This has a little metal clip on it. Again, it'll only plug in one way and that metal clip is essentially a release. It plugs into your drive and then it plugs in the right hand side right near the bottom into the SATA port and this allows for the transfer of data between them. You may find you have one cable which has a 90 degree angle on it 
which you can plug in. And then the other end is a flat connector, which plugs into the SSD. You've got two different styles of cables. Either one's got a flat end on both ends, or, or you've got one that's a 90 degree and then a flat end on the other connector. Now we're on to graphics cards, and this is a 3090 to start with. This has a 8-pin CPU power connector. So this cable has the connection on one end and then two other connectors on the other end marked PCIe. You'll notice that they're split in parts. This is a pigtail design, which means it has two parts to it. So there's a power cable that plugs into the power supply, and then you've got two cables essentially. We also have two of these included, and they both have that pigtail set up. Now this isn't actually ideal from this power supply. Really, it'd be better to have a cable that has just one connector on either end. Because for this graphics card, we need two 8-pin CPU power connectors. And it's a 3090, which means it's pretty powerful. But if you have a lesser GPU, that might be fine. You can see we're looking for the PCIe power connectors on here, which are marked CPU slash PCIe. You plug in the cable into that, and then the other end is going to plug into the graphics card. Now, we're going to need to set this up and then plug the power cables in. Note, as I've said already, but you wanna make sure everything's installed. Well, if you do this, but I just wanna make it clear how you do it and where these things plug in. You can see on this end of the graphics card, we've got two eight pin power connectors in here, which need to be plugged in. Again, there's a plastic clip on top to let you know which way around the cable should go. But the difficulty with this you'll find is that the eight pin power connectors are actually split in two. You've got one six pin power connector and then one with two pins in it. You have to push those two together with the little clips on the side and then hold it in place while you then push it into the GPU's power connector. It's a little bit fiddly to do and can cause some problems. If you find into your graphics card isn't working properly, it could be that the two pins have come a little bit loose during this process. So just check and make sure they're fully secured. Now, on a lesser graphics card, you could use the pigtail setup so that you use the other 8-pin connector and plug that into the second power cable. However, I'd suggest that on a 3090 or something equally powerful, you would actually want to not do that and instead use a separate power cable from the power supply unit and then plug in the other end to your GPU. So you've got two cables, one for each port on the graphics card. This will ensure better power through to the GPU and that you get the most performance out of it. The downside is because these are both pigtail cables, you're then left with these two extra cables that are then dangling around and won't look very neat. So you'd need to find somewhere to hide those away. Now for a 40 series GPU from Nvidia, life's a little bit easier because this power supply comes with that special 12 volt high power cable, which is marked 450 watts on this. So this has the same connection on both ends. One end plugs into the graphics card, one into the power supply. There's no additional pigtail cables. There's no complications. The only thing to bear in mind is that you do need to make sure that both ends are fully secured into the power supply and into the graphics card and that there's no extra tension put on this with it's being bent at weird angles that could cause problems because some of these have melted on higher end GPUs. You plug it into the power supply, make sure it's pushed all the way in, fully secured as with any of these cables, but it's particularly important with these ones because they have a lot of power running through them potentially on the Hydro graphics cards. And then you'd secure the other end into that slot on the GPU. There's only a single connector. Now, this goes in place of the adapters that probably came with your graphics card, which is nice. So if you've got this cable, you don't need to use that cable, which has multiple cables coming out of it. Instead, you can just slot this power cable right in and have a single connection that's a lot neater. Now, when you've established what cables you need for your power supply, I'd recommend plugging them all in before you start mounting it into the case. This will ensure that life is a lot easier in terms of the cable management and also just plugging things in. Because if you put all the power supply into the case and then you find you are missing a cable because you need an additional one, trying to plug it in afterwards is always a hassle. You'll then find there are PSU screws in the box for the case. You should also have some with your power supply alternatively. And then you want to mount it this way around so the fan is facing outwards because it will be pulling cold air in from the side of the case and then exhausting out of the rear. You then secure it in four corners at the rear of the case. You should find the holes there line up. You'll notice there's a little foot at the bottom of the power supply where it can sit on basically a little shelf to hold it into place while you secure it. And then you can just tighten those screws up. 
I showed in the review, by the way, that this case is quite roomy. You can fit larger power supplies in there. I did fit 1,500 watt PSU in this case fairly easily. So if you're using a different PSU as not to worry, you should be able to find it fits in there quite well. And then we need to make sure we're running the power cables through. And I'd use the Montec loops in here, the Velcro ties. There's also Velcro ties included in the accessories box just to sort of secure these down and to get them out of the way for now. We will be plugging them in in a little while and I'll show you where, but just making sure they're in the right direction and as neat as possible right now will make your life a little easier. That's an important point of this. You will see me doing a little bit of cable tidying in this case more than I'd usually do because what you'll find is that you can accidentally see quite a few of the cables visible from the front if you're mounting fans or a radiator to the side. Something to bear in mind. Then with an ATX motherboard, you can just pop that in quite easily because all the standoffs in place are already ready for ATX motherboards. So we just slot it into place, carefully lowering it down in there and then secure it with nine screws, three across the top, three across the middle, three across the bottom. And you'll have the motherboard screws included in that accessories box again. And then we're going to deal with those cables from the case itself and the power cables as well, just plugging them into the motherboard, making sure everything's set up, ready to go. So I'll quickly demonstrate these. I've got them laid out so you can see what's what. We've got a five volt RGB header, power button with a front panel connector, 3.5 millimeter USB-C and USB-A. So the USB-A connection is this flat one here, which you'll notice has a little plastic notch on it sticking out. You usually plug that in just below the 24 pin power cable on your motherboard. This motherboard actually has two ports that you could potentially plug it into. One that's set off to the side here, a bit lower down, which means that you can adjust the way the cable looks and pop it in like that. Then there's the USB-C connection, which actually can only plug in one way, which is fairly unique. So just watch out for that. You need to make sure you've got it the right way around. If you have, you should hear a click when you push it into place. And that's the front panel connectors on the front of the case when you use those. The other one you'll need is the front panel connector, which goes into the bottom right here. You can see it's marked panel one, but it'd usually be something like F panel and other things. This is the power button, the reset switch, the hard disk drive LED and things like that. It's all in one single cable here. It only plugs in one direction because you'll notice there are some pins missing on it. The same for HD audio, which is on the left hand side. This is for your 3.5 millimeter jacks on the front of the case for headset and microphone. And again, this is missing pins, so you can only plug it in one way. You'll notice the labeling is facing upwards in this instance and away from me when I plugged it in there. The other things to watch out for are the USB ports, which we'll need in a minute, and the five volt RGB header, which is a three pin header, which you can see is marked ADDR LED1 on this case. And there's also other ports available on the motherboard. You should usually find multiple ports for this. And this is for the LED strip that runs down the front of the case. Then as I showed you, plug in the 24 pin power connector and the eight pin power connectors and those cables that I've just shown you now. Secure those so they're out of the way and then you can do some cable management and neaten things up. For the HD audio and the front panel connectors, run them along the bottom because you can then neaten things up there. You'll see I've actually run them underneath the shelf for the power supply for the HD audio connector, for example, so you can actually hide it away a little bit. And then you'll find them sticking out at the bottom and can plug them in. You'll notice that I mentioned USB. We're going to need that for the Kraken cooler a little later on, which plugs in and needs that for the RGB lighting from its fans and for the display. That will plug in in the middle there as well. Now for the fan mounting. So I mentioned that you can mount fans either to this side here or to the front. So you can mount them to this tray and you could potentially have it like this if you wanted to. So you could set them up like that and then you screw the fans in from the rear and just plug them in. Alternatively, you can unscrew the thumb screws and then pull the bracket out. Note that it's on a hinge, so you sort of pull it out and then lift it up and then tug it through. You'll then notice there's a bracket at the top of the case which you should unscrew slightly and then adjust downwards. And then there's another bracket at the bottom. So the thumb screws that you took out, you reuse those to re-secure it onto these two mounting points. And that's how you get the two front fans if you're going to be using that airflow bracket, which I am. And that way you can set those up. Obviously put those with the fan blades facing outwards so that they can suck cold air in from the front 
and then blow it into your case and that will be blown across things. Push those in, make sure the cables are running through to the rear. You'll find some holes in this tray for doing that and then secure those with the fan screws that come with the fans. So I'm using Montec fans here. It comes with screws in each box. Secure that to that tray, then run the cables to the rear. Now, I would note that you do need to make sure your cable tidying. I used a lot of the plastic cable ties that were included and some additional ones to secure these cables and neaten things up. I'm then mounting two extra fans to the side of the tray and these are 140 millimeter reverse blade fans. So the fans are facing inwards, but in this instance, they're actually pulling air from the rear of the case. You secure those by using the fan screws and basically tighten them up on that rear bracket as we did with the SSDs. So just securing those there. You could use 120 millimeter fans instead if you wanted to, but we've got 140 here. Again, plastic cable ties on the cables and you'll find there are some loops in a few different places that you can use to neaten things up this way. This keeps them a bit out of view because once you've removed the side tray and put it on the front, you can see into the back a lot more, which makes it a bit messy. Now, I recommended earlier on using 120 millimeter fans on the bottom here. You'll see there are various different mounting points for the screws and they're different from the 140 millimeter, so you can tell where they're meant to mount. So you just need to line them up. And then we use the long screws that are included in the accessories box. So rather than screwing in from below, you're actually using the long screws that come with the case to secure the fans this way. These are 120 millimeter standard blade fans. So we're putting them face down, which means we're not getting the RGB lighting as well. You might be better off buying the reverse blade fans instead. You'd have nicer RGB lighting if you wanted that. You could put them face upwards instead. But here we want to make sure we've got the most airflow so we've got air blowing directly onto the graphics card from below and good intake that way. So you can see we've got a lot of intake fans here. The front, the side and the bottom are all set to intake. Now this rear fan which is 120 millimeter, is an exhaust fan and then I'm also going to be exhausting through the radiator as well. So we'll have four exhaust fans and then a mass of intake fans for cool air. I've actually done a video separately on the best place for your all-in-one cooler which you might find interesting and useful. But in this build, because I wanted to use a large cooler and I think it looks nicer than the 280mm mounted to the side, we ended up with that compromise. Now for the fan control, I actually recommend using this Thermalright fan hub, which allows you to control the RGB lighting and fan speed for up eight fans. It's really simple to use as well and it's much easier than trying to connect directly to the motherboard with the chassis fan headers and the system fan headers. As I said, I've done a separate wiring guide on this, but you can see it has ports for both the fan power and RGB. It then has two cables that you'd plug into either end to connect to your motherboard, so you can still control the lighting that way. This allows you to power all those fans quite easily, but it does require SATA power, which you'll see marked power input on the end, which is the same cable from your SSDs that I showed you earlier. So this thing has separate cables in it for your ARGB input, which is that same five volt connector that I showed you for the case that plugs in on the motherboard. And then the PWM input, which is the fan power cable, which means that the fan speed can then be controlled by the motherboard as well. That would plug into a system fan header or chassis fan header on your motherboard. So we need the SATA power cable is a very important part of this. It's the same one we use for the SSDs, plugs into the SATA port. If you're not using SSDs, you're still going to need this cable if you're following along. So you plug that in and then that plugs into the other end marked power input on the control box. Again, I'm showing you this outside the case, but you will do it when it's all installed. Then one by one, plugging in your fans into each of the ports. The five volt cable will only go in one way. So the RGB connector has three pins in it. You need to take care which way round you're putting it in because you can only put it in one way. And the same for the power cable, which has a little notch on it. And then you basically just repeat this process, filling up the slots with all the fans that you've installed and plugging them in. This thing will work with Signal RGB, which I'll show you later on, but it will also work with your motherboard software so you can control the RGB lighting and with your BIOS as well, so you can control the fan speed and easily do that. 
So here you can see the end process of what you would do, plugging in all those cables. You'll see the controller is quite big, so you do need to make sure you've got room for it. You could potentially put it in one of the hard disk drive cages and nestle it away. Just don't forget you will need power. It needs power cable plugged into your power supply unit or it won't work. And then plug in the five volt connection and the system fan header on your motherboard. Now for the radiator mounting, you can mount it to this top tray. Now this tray can be taken out with four screws that you can remove from the top and then you can take the tray out. You don't have to, but I thought this would be an easier process for doing it. Take it out, remember which direction it was facing when you took it out, and then you're going to put it on top of the radiator, mount the radiator to it, and then put the radiator back in the case. So this is the NZXT Kraken cooler, it's 360 millimeter with that comes some small screws and washers. Use those to fully secure the radiator to the fan tray and think about the orientation of the tubes. You can see I've got the tubes on the left hand side. You might choose to put them on the right hand side. I covered these sorts of things in the full guide on that cooler but you can see the way that's going to work. The fan cabling heading towards the back, the tubes on the left. I have found the tubes don't seem to interfere with that rear fan so it's a personal choice which way around you put it, whether they're on the right or the left. But then we're securing this down, making sure not to pinch any of the cables with that fan tray, which could potentially be a problem, and then re-secure the four screws that you took out to remove that tray, and then you then go about the rest of the build. The next part is to put thermal paste on. I've actually used this cooler before. Usually it comes with pre-applied thermal paste, so you wouldn't need to do this. But I've got some Arctic paste, which I'm using here, because I have used the cooler before. So just applying that to the IHS, making sure there's a nice thin coverage across that and then secure the pump down on top. Now you can see I've got the cables pointing up towards the top of this. And then we just need to make sure you put the four thumb screws through to the standoffs that we put in earlier on and then secure those, tighten them up one by one. And then I'd recommend using a screwdriver just to make sure they're fully tightened don't over tighten it, don't force them, but you do need to make sure they're all secure. Otherwise you might find your CPUs running a bit hot and that could be one of the simple reasons why. Then we run those cables back to the rear of this. Now the cables for this actually have a fan power connection for the three fans that are on top of the radiator and a USB connection for the pumps, the display on it and the SATA power for that to make sure it has power through to it and another cable which plugs into the AIO pump header on the motherboard or the CPU fan connection. You then have an NZXT controller which you also need to plug the RGB cables in and that plugs into SATA power and to the motherboard with the USB. But you can see we've got the three fan powers connecting up here with the fan power connections plugging in there to the header so it actually plugs directly into the pump and then you need SATA power for that. So that basically is an all-in-one system. Everything's controlled by your motherboard via USB, but it's all powered through to the pump itself. So the fans and the pump all work together in a nice system, which makes life easier. But you do need to remember to plug in the USB connection to the bottom of your motherboard SATA power as well for both the pump and for the RGB controller to make sure that's all connected up nicely. And then we've got to try and secure those cables. As you can see at this stage of the build, the mess is getting a bit crazy at the back here, which is why I recommended cable tidying so much, because even when you shut the door, some of it's still gonna be visible through the front if you're not careful. Don't forget, we also need to plug in the SATA power and data cables for your SSDs and hard disk drives, if you've not done that already, as I showed you earlier. So plug those in and run those cables through. Now with the SSD on the side tray, you'll see, as I was saying, it's a bit tricky to run that cable from the power supply over to the top and then over to that left-hand side. I found this was particularly difficult, which is why I wouldn't necessarily recommend putting an SSD on that door. And then you've also got to get that data cable. It's a little bit fiddly to do, but it is one of the mounting options there. Then obviously plugging in those data cables to the motherboard to make sure the data is going to pass through properly. And then we're getting close to the end of the build, as you can see now, everything's looking good. And we turn it on, you can see all the fans are running, the RGBs on, the pump display is lighting up, and we've got some good lighting on the motherboard suggesting everything's working as it should be. Obviously, I've not put the GPU in yet. I'm going to show you two different options for the mounting of this. Obviously, the standard orientation. So this is the 4090 as a reminder to show you the size of the case. Even with the front fan tray in place, you can still fit this Strix 4090 in without any problems. So it's a nice roomy case for that. 
you need to take two brackets out on the left hand side and then mount your GPU into the top PCIe slot, ensure the fastest speed there, and then re-secure it with the screws that were holding those brackets in place on the left hand side and that will make sure it's in place and working properly there. In a second I'll show you how to vertically mount your GPU as an alternative if you prefer but what I found is this is spacious enough to enable this installation in the standard position and then run that 12 volt high power cable from below from the back from the power supply unit through here and then plug it in. So you can do it in this way fairly easily if you want to. I didn't find there was any issues with this process and it will install like this. But if you want a nice aesthetic, then you could use a vertical mount. And I'm using Lee and Lee's vertical GPU mount for this. Remove the majority of the PCIe brackets from your case, and then we're going to use this bracket. Now this bracket quite simply has a cable in it that basically replaces the connection directly to the motherboard. So you slot your GPU into that as you would normally the PCIe connection on the motherboard push it in and then secure it to the bracket. This bracket then slots into the case and the way it works is that cable will plug in to the motherboard and then the graphics card is secured to the case using the various screws that we just removed from the case that would usually hold those brackets in place. You'll notice there are two screws here that we still need to secure the graphics card to this bracket first of all and then you put it into the case. So what we then do is you need to then work out how to get the cable in. So we put it in that top slot again, push that in properly, make sure it's fully seated in there. And then we're going to slot the GPU into it. Now this is just an aesthetic thing. It won't improve the cooling performance, but you can see it does look nicer. And this bracket does ensure that it sits far enough back from the glass that it won't get choked and it should still work nicely. Do make sure that you have enough room for it. So for example, I had to remove the top bracket, which I hadn't done before as well, before I could fully fit this in and then use all the thumb screws to secure. You will notice that I'm holding it up because it does sag quite a bit when you've got it in this position, but you wouldn't normally be laying your PC flat like this. So you won't find that problem when you do it. The other thing is then we just need to make sure all of those are secure and then you've got to plug the power cable in. So because I had it running from the bottom before and plugging in, I actually had to run it from the back so you can hide it away and then plug it in at the top. And then we should find that hopefully your system will boot and you should get into the BIOS. So you can see the ASRock BIOS here. Now I don't have Windows installed at this point so I thought I'd quickly go through that process as well. I've got a Windows boot media on this USB drive, which I've shown a video on how to do that before. Plug that in and then restart the computer. From there, it should then automatically recognize the, the USB stick and go through the Windows setup process. You then just need to follow the instructions on screen to go about the installation process here. Find the relevant drive that you want to use. So in this instance, I'm using that crucial T705 drive as the main boot drive. You can either format a drive or just click to then copy the files over to the disk and that will go through that process and it will take some time so I'll obviously skip that and then it will want to restart. When it goes through the restart process just pull that thumb drive out so it doesn't try to boot from that again and then it should go into the carrying on of the installation of Windows. Just follow your steps through there put in your relevant details and then you should find you can get into Windows. If you then in there, you should probably use an Ethernet connection. That would be the easiest way to connect to the internet. And if not, you might have to download some drivers for that. But once you've got that all set up, you can then check for Windows updates, which I'd recommend as one of the first things you do to make sure your system's up to date. And also download the other relevant things that you'll be using. So for an Intel motherboard, I'd use Intel's drivers and support system because this will help you find a lot of different things, including Bluetooth drivers, Wi-Fi drivers, Ethernet drivers, and other things. I'd also recommend downloading NVIDIA's beta app, which is new and replaces GeForce Experience, and it's a much better way of looking for your drivers, but also for optimizing your system for gaming and for recording things and for getting data out of there. Then I'm also downloading NZXT's cam software so we can control the lighting and the styling of the pump. And then Signal RGB is another download that I've used in this system so that we can control the RGB lighting of everything really easily. The downside to this is Signal doesn't work with the display quite yet. 
However, they have said that they are working on a fix for that. So hopefully we'll see that in the near future. And then we have the finished build. Hopefully this has been a very insightful guide onto this case and how to use it and how to set it up and the different options available to you. If you found it useful, please consider subscribing and let me know in the comments or just smashing that like button, anything you can do to help me out because I've put a lot of effort into this video, as you can imagine. But you can see we've got a very nice build that I'm pretty happy with and hopefully you will be with yours too. Thanks for watching. You've made it right to the end of the video, you brilliant legend you. If you've enjoyed it, click that subscribe button, give me a thumbs up, and drop me a comment down below if you've got any questions. If you really enjoyed it, consider joining the channel and see the benefits of doing so. Check out these other videos. You might well find them interesting or useful. And most importantly, have a great life.